Welcome to another session of Bites and Sips, where we will share the Word of God and we can escort it with the, uh, your favorite drink for mine today is water. Um, it's good to take water. Let us do a recap of the last session that we held. Get ready with, your, with, with the Bible or with your gadget, whatever it is, and let us just see what we have for today's bite. In our last session, we saw our ancestor, Abram, faced with famine in the very land that God had directed him to go to, prompting us to ask whether, can God send you, where there is trouble, where there is calamity? But we also mentioned that we are not called to ease, but to a life filled with challenges as God fulfills his purposes. Ours is to remain faithful. So let's continue with our bite today. It's the same book of Genesis 12. Turn with me to Genesis 12 and we are reading from verse 10 to 17. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. Verse 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Today's title, nothing but the truth. Hmm. Verse 10 has this phrase, for a while, because the famine was severe, Abram decided to seek refuge in Egypt for a while. It was supposed to be a temporary a solution. You know, he probably rationalized that I cannot stay here and die. I hear there is food in Egypt. I must quickly go there just for this time that there is a calamity here. Let me seek that solution. What has it that there is food in Egypt? I will go there for a short while and then come out so, can I, so that I can continue with God's directives. So it is as if here now it is survival for the fittest. I need to do something urgent. And so we see Abram looking for a quick fix, if we may call it that, to resolve a problem just this once. And we do like to say that just this once, let me just do it. Just this once, let me do it. I will never do it again. But just this once, let me just sort this thing out. Have you ever been flagged down by the police, the traffic on the road? And it's, you're in a different county, for example, and, um, and your first aid box does not have bandage. That is one of the reasons I've ever been flagged down for. And I'm told, okay, this is how much you need to pay. This is where you, you must appear in, in court on this day for... And I'm like, okay, all that. And the temptation is so high to just give this policeman that 1,000 shillings so that, well, it's, it saves the day. I'm in a hurry to go elsewhere. I cannot make another trip to come back to this county to go to court. I mean, you irrationalize just like Abraham did. And you say, just this once, mm, let me just sort it and no problem. And that's a trap. That is our Egypt. That is where Abram goes to Egypt to seek a solution. That's what happens to us. We also seek our Egypt. So as they like saying, we end up in the same WhatsApp group with Abram, where we have looked for a quick fix. 
and then we are quiet about it. And usually the solution is a shortcut that has got everything going for it. You know, look at it. Abram is located in a place where there is famine. Egypt, on the other hand, has food. And you know what? Egypt was so civilized by then. So I can imagine even the lure of a civilized city. It already has cities, you know. And here is Abram, you know, journeying in this endless land that is, has even famine to accompany it. So the lure to go to Egypt is very high. Just like the lure to give that note and, you know, end this long story is very high. So Abram decides to strategize. We encounter him laying out a strategy, a plot, and he, this is how he, he, he starts it. You know, he starts with an in-house communication between him and his wife. And this is what he's telling her. As he was about to enter Egypt, verse 11, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Affirmation, wonderful. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Mm. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman, just as he had predicted. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. Abram had actually predicted that this might happen. Mm. Excellent. He was on point. His fears played out just as he'd predicted. You know, I can almost hear him whisper to Sarai, you see, I told you. Because what I thought would happen is actually happening. So go along with our plan. This is the only way we shall survive this. Indeed, his wife was an eye catcher. You know, the Bible says she's beautiful. You know, it's like nobody can pass and not, you know, look again. This is a beautiful woman. She calls the attention of everyone. What a beauty she must have been. That even Pharaoh's officials decide, no, this one, only the Pharaoh can have. Our master, the king, is the only one who deserves to have this one. She must have been a beauty. And so we can see why Abram had to do this rationalization. He is aware that I have a beautiful wife. Oh, dear me. But think again. Why all this plot? What was the objective of this plot? This is what we read in verse 13. So that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Selfish me is the bottom line here. Sounds familiar. The Babel projects so that we can make a name for ourselves. For Abram at this point it was I will be treated well. My life will be spared. Of course, given that small hint for your sake. So, Abraham is here with his grand plan. But bottom line, selfish. Verse 16 says, He treated Abraham well for her sake. And Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. His strategy worked. Though not truthful, it seems to work. The guy grew rich, courtesy of his prized beauty in Pharaoh's palace. He was getting away with this small lie. By the way, Abram's proposal was a half-truth. Because Sarai was actually a daughter of Terah by another wife. So that we find in Genesis chapter 20 in verse 12. So Sarai is actually Abram's stepsister. Okay? So when he says, just say you are my sister, it's a half truth. But Abram and Sarai, the silent listener and participant to this plot, they did wrong in telling only half the truth. Hiding the real situation for fear of harm. Ever been in that position or situation? Yes, I have. Where small adjustments here and there will save the day. Maybe you're an accountant in your office. Maybe by just adjusting a small figure, that will keep off the auditor's scrutiny. Maybe there's some inventory somewhere you have had to adjust so that things don't look bad. 
we do small things here and there so that we don't rock the boat, so that things remain calm. This is what happened to Abram, that we need to do this so that this does not get us down, so that we survive this crisis. But something happened. And that something always happens when you decide to hide away something, to tell a half truth, to deny the truth from being exposed. Something always happens. Let me call it a happenstance. And for Abraham, it came sooner than he knew it. Abraham's prediction was true, yes, but he left out a very important detail. Some information about the way of life for the Egyptian was not in Abraham's mind. You know, that of all the virtues that the Egyptians held, truth was given the greatest store. Lying was the vice they held in greatest abhorrence. So Egyptians respected and honored truth. This would be Abram's undoing. He has already strategized, come up with a plot, but is not a truthful uh, plot. It is something that is conniving, something that has, has laced the real truth with something of a half lie, a half truth in there. Then what happened? Abram's sweet life of acquiring good wealth, verse 16, in what we have read in verse 16, did not go on for long. Something interrupted it. Something happened in verse 17. But the Lord, but the Lord happened. We read in verse 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. Friend, God is truth. Truth is God's very nature. And therefore, he cannot abide in lies or half truths. He cannot. And so, being the loving God that he is, being the one who was on this journey, has been sending out Abraham on his route, he had to pursue him and put things right. So things would have been much easier had Abraham told the truth. The Egyptian king whom Abraham had deceived was more open and straightforward than Abraham. Without delay, he drove Abraham from Egypt in disgrace, as we have read. And I'm not sure any of Pharaoh's officials, or even in Egypt, they had a good testimony of this man of God who has come to live with us escaping the famine in his land. A writer wrote this, It is better to starve in Canaan, if it should be so, than live in luxury in Egypt. Mm -hmm. It is better far to suffer in God's path than be at ease in Satan's. It is better to be poor with Christ than rich without him. Egypt was not the place of God's presence. It had no altars for communion with Abram's God. Abram had no business being in Egypt. Friend, what is your Egypt today? Is it the very job that you're holding, that you got courtesy of some papers that were forged, some half-truths and lies given here and there, so that you are you're in that position today? Is it even the relationship that you're in today where your partner does not know some truths about you? You have kept some information away just to keep the boat sailing smoothly. Is it a business practice that you're doing secretly that you know is wrong, but because it is your means of survival, you have continued to do it? We are called to live out truth to live in truth. We may appear to even thrive by the strategies and the plots that we come up with, but not for long. Just like God interfered with Abraham's plot, rest assured he will interfere because he's a loving God and he wants you to come away and fulfill the purposes for which he called you. Lastly, not only did Pharaoh get hurt, 
and the and his household but many people suffered we have read but the lord inflicted serious diseases on pharaoh and his household our lies do not only hurt us but even others around us you know see how cheating in exams has produced workers in the marketplace who know little of what profession they confess to represent now we are the sufferers why would you want to harm fellow human beings by your half truths and your half lies ephesians 4:15 says this instead speaking the truth in love we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. The truth is to be spoken, the simple and vanished truth. This is the way to avoid error. And this is the way to preserve others from error. In opposition to all trick, all fraud and deception, Christians are to speak the simple truth and nothing but the truth. Every statement we make should be the unvarnished truth. Truth is the representation of things as they are. And there is no virtue that is more valuable in a Christian than the love of simple truth. The early Egyptian knew that, that truth is important. I pray that we would turn around and let go of the life that we are living, the lie that we are living, the half-truths that we have lived by, that today we will turn it over to Christ, that he would sort us out. Let us pray together. Our Father and our God, we come before you acknowledging how far sometimes we fall from living out the truth that is found in you. Forgive us. Forgive us for the lies that we have lived, for the lies that we have told, for the things that we have, you know, denied to expose in totality, just that because we feared the consequences thereof. Father, we ask that you forgive us. And we ask that Lord Almighty, you grant us the boldness, grant us the boldness to declare the truth, the simple truth, and leave you to sort out the details. We thank you, we honor you, we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friend, let us live in truth. Let God sort out the consequences of our truth. Let's see you again next Friday. God bless you.